he was not only intelligent, he was able, and he was a genius. At that time, the time of his glory or so, for us young people, he was like a nice uncle. To me, he's the hero of the white race. The great man like Adolf Hitler comes along once every thousand years. Hitler was a kind of idealist. Toward the end of the war, when his generals came to him and say, we need trains to carry the troops to the Western Front to stop the Americans who were marching toward Germany, he said, no, I need the trains to kill the Jews. I like to believe that I was able to find hope in hopelessness. I believe all of us had that opportunity, but the people who went to the gas chamber were never given that opportunity. Hitler is forever branded in the minds of the world as a monster. Stalin killed more people than Hitler ever killed. They were both monsters. But Stalin arrived where Stalin arrived because of terror. He was a great believer in killing people. People said, that's going to get you into trouble. And he said, no, there won't be any trouble. Death solves everything. No man, no problem. At the same time, I know of people who had suffered under him and yet recognized him as a great man. He was a man of many faces, sort of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> History celebrates the great butchers. That's the sad fact of it. It's always been like that, at the cost of oceans of blood. This is CBS Reports. Tonight, Hitler and Stalin, Legacy of Hate. With Charles Kuralt and General H. Norman Schwarzkopf. Good evening. Tonight we are going to recall two monsters of the human race who caused the death of tens of millions of people. And we ought to say at the outset, uh, General, that Hitler and Stalin were not created dictators by an act of God. They were created by the weakness in human beings that leads them to put their faith in Führers and, and Commissars. And Pharaohs and Caesars. It's been going on for a long time. Particularly during hard times, there's always some strong man or some scoundrel that comes along appealing to nationalism and offering salvation. That's why the, the Great Depression of the 30s was an ideal spawning ground for these tyrants. I guess the worrisome thing is it's going on still today. We have Saddam Hussein in Iraq, we have ethnic cleansing going on in Bosnia, and amazingly we have neo-Nazis in Germany who are attacking foreigners and holding Hitler up as the ideal leader. And in the confusion of post-communist Russia, there are actually people in the streets demonstrating their affection and nostalgia for Joseph Stalin. <laughs> Why we have so many confrontations now? Because lots of people believe in him till now and believe the system was the right one. Russians yearn for the restoration of order and they fear chaos and disorder in a way that we simply cannot understand. That's what makes a Stalin figure so attractive to them. And today, it looks like chaos to an awful lot of them. Those people who were not touched by the Persians, who did not die in the camps, They've seen only the good side of Stalin. And the more we say bad things about Stalin, the better people think about it. Go to the villages, go to the factories. You'll see portraits of Stalin more today than two years ago, three years ago. How can you explain that? Stalin, who killed millions, the more tragic the situation in this country is, less food we've got, the more chaos there is, the, the stronger the necessity of Stalin is, the, 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 the wider the base is for another Stalin to come. Our luck is that today there's no Stalin. We can't s see him. But imagine this man appears tomorrow. 
As the ghost of Joseph Stalin inhabits the Russian memory, Adolf Hitler also still lives. There is a new generation of Nazis in Germany. I was always fascinated by him because if you see the pictures, they say enough. You can see the people crying and the flags and how they are marching and so on. This was something I connected with the cry of my blood. His greatest problem, of course, was to lose this war because uh, if he would not have lost this war, today he would be a hero. It is illegal in Germany to call yourself a Nazi, but a few thousand Germans do, and they are supported by their American counterparts, led by Gerhard Lauch. National socialism is a living doctrine. It is the faith of the right race. As long as one right man is alive, national socialism is alive, and it's our duty to fight for it. We believe that the right race is threatened in the United States, Germany, and all countries. The white man is a minority. His countries are being flooded by non-white immigrants. Once they get here, they, they breed like rats, and then eventually they want to marry our women, and they mongolize our race. The first thing we want is um, to reduce the number of the strangers living in Germany. That's the um, greatest problem we see. In Germany in the last year, there have been more than 2,000 violent attacks on foreigners. I believe that a national socialist government can easily solve the problem simply basically by physically separating the non-whites from the whites. Uh, we can uh, segregate them, we can deport them, or we can exterminate them. They represent an extremely small minority in Germany. Most Germans absolutely reject them. The fact that hundreds of thousands of good Germans take to the street to protest it is a fantastic sign. That never happened in the 1930s. But if we dismiss them and ignore them, that's exactly how we give them room to grow. That's the mistake they made 50 years ago. Hitler was dismissed in the 1930s. Tragedy is that he took power in the first place. Remember this, Adolf Hitler rose to power in Germany, while the rest of the world was preoccupied with problems of its own. My father, after hearing Hitler for the first time, was convinced this is the coming leader of Germany. Many people laughed and scoffed and said, this, this is a charlatan, this is a mountebank, this is a rabble-rouser, he will never amount to anything, no chance at all, but they were wrong and my father was right. When I was a boy, my father told me about the parties in Germany, the different parties which existed in the German democracy, and he said one of them is a man by the name of Hitler, and he looks like a hairdresser. <laughs> The first time that I saw Hitler speak, I noticed that the crowd would get to the auditorium and fill it well ahead of time. Bands would play, other people would speak, the crowd would get tired. I mean, he was, Hitler's late, Hitler's late, Hitler's late. Then suddenly, the Baden-Weiler march would start up, which was sort of the signature that he was going to appear. By that time, everybody was ready for anything, so the crowd would erupt. Every time I got back to Berlin from boarding school in England, and there was Hitler, he knew and understood his capacity to move people. He did something that I have never, ever again seen any speaker anywhere do. He would get onto a platform and wait for a full 60 seconds saying nothing. Then the crowd had simmered down and was leaning toward him almost. You ask anyone who speaks publicly if they have the guts to take a watch and wait 60 seconds to speak. The first impression I had was how utterly ordinary he seemed. If you didn't know his reputation, you wouldn't look at him twice. You'd never notice him. But that ordinary impression didn't last because uh, you saw him or heard him very soon and he was not ordinary, he was extraordinary. Sie wollten Herr kompromisslos die einzige Macht und alleinige Macht in Deutschland. He became electrified. 
He became a conqueror. He became defiant. He moved his head as though he controlled the whole audience, which he did. He had one theme, and that theme was hatred, vengeance. The Germans had been beset all these years by enemies, and he was going to put an end to that. At the top of his blustering voice, Adolf Hitler blamed all of Germany's troubles on Jews and foreigners. Ordinary Germans, yearning to have pride in their shattered country, sat up and listened. He never could have come to power in an ordinary set of circumstances. But they were not ordinary. They were extraordinary. They were extraordinarily bad. And therefore, Hitler stepped forth and said, I will save you from all of this. And in fact, let's face it, did. The German experience of the 20s was a nightmare. Socially, psychologically, politically, a madhouse. People were confused, and civil wars raged in, in, inside Germany in the 1920s, uh, private armies fighting each other, uh, general strikes, and on and on. Wherever I went, there was despair. People felt there was a profound crisis, and everything ought to be changed. Who could have imagined that Adolf Hitler might be the instrument of change? He was a high school dropout from Austria, a failed art student, a seller of picture postcards. When World War I broke out, he joined the Bavarian army. He was a good soldier. In fact, his army records read very well. He was decorated for heroism. But he never passed the rank of corporal. His officers thought he was too fanatical and moody to be a leader. After the war, he promoted himself to leader, with a handful of fanatics and malcontents just like himself as followers. They called themselves grandly the National Socialist Party. Their strong-arm attempt to overthrow the Bavarian government landed Hitler in prison. There, he began a piece of writing which should have served as a warning to the world, a treatise which he finished after his release from prison at a small hotel in the Alps. He sat here in this quiet corner of the Platterhof Hotel with the Bavarian sunlight streaming over his shoulder. And here he completed his book, Mein Kampf, his stern philosophy and plan for the future of Germany. Adolf Hitler, what we must fight for is the survival of our race and the purity of our blood. The mightiest counterpart to the Aryan is represented by the Jew. Was there any form of filth or waste without at least one Jew involved in it? To cut even cautiously into such an abscess, you found, like a maggot in a rotting body often dazzled by a sudden light, a kike. We were young and easily convinced. And of course we wanted radical solutions, all young people, want your radical solutions. And so we entered in his party. We were marching, goose-stepping on Sunday in the streets and singing songs and so on. It wasn't very serious, but we felt ourselves something special. We were tall, we were Nordic, good race, no? and we thought we are the future aristocracy. Hitler was saying things that Germans love to hear, any country would have loved to hear from their leader. You're special because your race makes you special. You're born of a blood that historically is the best in all of history. It's a pure blood. Oh, it's been ruined for generations with all of these cross mixers. God, we have Jews and gypsies and French and British and all these people have come into Germany and they've just ruined our heritage. But if we can weed them all out and just make it really a Nordic blood, an Aryan blood, you're biologically purer than anybody on earth. That appealed to people. It appealed so strongly that Adolf Hitler was elected Chancellor of Germany. In the next two years, he rewrote the Constitution, burned books, and murdered opponents. Even murdered some old friends. In every one of us, there is a tendency to be sympathetic. If you see someone being hurt, you tend automatically to feel sympathetic. 
If you have a friend, you have a certain tie to him. Hitler had none. That was vacant from him. He was born without it. His closest friend was Ernst Röhm, who built up the stormtroops and helped him come to power. You would have thought he'd be very close to Röhm, but after Hitler had been in power one year, he decided Röhm was uh, trouble for him. So he simply ordered him killed and went to be present at the killing. I never knew how powerful Hitler was until I saw him at the Nuremberg party rally. I remember that my knees were shaking. And being one of the smallest ones, I stood about 60 feet from the podium. And when he roared out, you are flesh of my flesh. It cannot be otherwise. You are our nation. You are going to be the leaders of the future. It was like a truck. You were totally obsessed by it. No leader could have done it, except for Hitler. He had an intuitive feeling for the darker side of the German soul. And he was able to mesmerize the people to such an extent that they literally destroyed themselves. The world had no way of knowing it at the time, Charles, but 1924 was a very bad year. That was the year that Hitler turned his Nazis into a national party in Germany, and Joseph Stalin was elected chairman of the Politburo in Russia. Both their mothers wanted them to be priests. In Stalin's case, of course, he became a Bolshevik instead. Stalin actually was about to be expelled from his Communist Party post by Lenin, the, the party's founder. But then Lenin died of a stroke in 1924, and Joseph Stalin took power so quickly that his rivals in the party never knew what hit them. Stalin was malevolent, wily, and cruel, and Stalin seized and first knocked off one faction, then the other faction. The people were incredulous that any one of their number would be that evil and that somebody among them would turn on the others and bit by bit eliminate them. I think it was just more than they could imagine. So he caught them by surprise for the first several years. And then he was too powerful. He was a very devious man. The man of many faces, sort of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, <laughs> in a way. Only a very few people knew him, and those who did were all scared of him. He was this idolatry. He was always presented as larger than life, whereas in fact he was five feet five. Churchill, who was five feet five and a half, was very pleased to be to note that he was taller than Stalin. When I saw Stalin for the first time, I even didn't recognize him. Certainly, I had an image about him before, because I, I saw him only in newsreels or in the big portraits that were carried. And I looked at him and I had a feeling like, like a shock, you know, that it's somebody else, it's not Stalin. A very small man, very gray face, nose and cheeks are all dotted with smallpox. Then also he was walking somehow strange, you know, one arm was shorter than another. It was like hidden, you know, in the arm of his jacket. The impression was strange, you know, but I certainly immediately understood it must be Stalin, but it is quite another person. <laughs> Joseph Stalin was not a spellbinding speaker, so he made few speeches. He didn't like the way he looked, so he was rarely photographed. And when it came to his private life, he kept it private. Here inside the city limits of Moscow is a place so well hidden that almost nobody in Russia knew that it existed. It seems a quiet rural retreat. It is five miles from the Kremlin. This was the secret home 
of Joseph Stalin. Many a night, the most powerful man in Russia sat around this table with Stalin, all of them drunk on vodka, joking and laughing, comrades all. Sooner or later, Stalin, seeing potential rivals among them, had nearly every one of them murdered. He was a great believer in killing people. He once said, quite early on, he'd shot some people in the Civil War, and he'd shot the wrong ones, and people said, that's going to get you into trouble. And he, and he said, um, no, there won't be any trouble. Death solves everything. No man, no problem. He also liked, you know, automobile accidents, you see, because in many cases he didn't want to have some public trial or some explanation. So just people would be killed in an automobile accident. He would ask, uh, invite some people whom he would give instructions. There would be a truck, something coming around the corner or something like that, and then the car was crashed. But then usually those people who were instructed were also shot then, because they knew too much, you see. And Stalin didn't like people who knew too much. He didn't see many foreigners. He didn't give interviews to the press. He didn't do anything. He just ran the whole thing. But when you did see him at a party, the thing that struck you was the terror which he inspired. And there they all were in their uniforms, shivering, all these generals and marshals, shivering with fright. Obviously people were scared. Yes, but the, what is remarkable is that at the same time, the people were ready to follow him. He had a sort of a charisma. I know of people who had suffered under him and yet recognized uh, him as a great man. He could be terribly nice to people on the other side. He, he killed uh, them in the thousands and in millions and was a uh, very strange combination, if I may say so. I met him once at this party, and you would say he was a very jolly good fellow. He liked to drink and to dance like a madman. He liked to have a very jolly, drunken atmosphere around him. But he was always looking at people, and they had to pretend to be feeling frankly jolly when they weren't. He was nice to the guests. He came even to the, to the, to the so-called nobodies, talked to them. And then he had very elegant movements. He gave you the impression to be a lynx or a tiger. I don't want to use the expression charm because that is wrong, but also a lion has a certain charm, a tiger has a certain charm, but he is a very dangerous animal. Joseph Stalin, murderer of millions, was a cruel husband and father. His first wife died in 1906, and there was a son. And Stalin didn't get on with him, and then he tried to commit suicide. The boy and Stalin just said, couldn't even shoot straight. Stalin's second wife did commit suicide after he mocked her brutally at a party. But for his daughter, Svetlana, Stalin had a soft spot. Dear little housekeeper, I got your letter today in postcard. I'm glad you haven't forgotten your little papa. I'm sending you a few red apples. In a few days, I'll send tangerines. I'm not sending Vasya any because he's doing badly in school. The weather is nice here. Only I'm lonely because my little housekeeper isn't with me. I give you a big kiss. Your papa. Like many loving fathers, Stalin disapproved of his daughter's first boyfriend. Unlike other such fathers, he had the boy arrested and sent to a prison camp. Stalin's murderous attention had in fact shifted from legitimate rivals to everyone in Russia. His paranoia cut a swath through every home. People in those days used to disappear just like that. I remember there were two postcards circulating in Europe. One was a photograph of Hitler fondling a little blonde German girl with a bunch of flowers perfect Aryan type. And simultaneously there came out a picture of Stalin with a little Central Asian girl. I was lucky enough to meet the little girl. And she said, well, about a month or two later, they came for my father. Scooped him up and never seen again. So my mother said, um, 
this must be a terrible mistake that nice comrade Stalin would never allow this to happen. So we'll write a letter to him. So I said, what happened then? Well, 48 hours later, they came for my mother. So then I was alone. The difference between the Soviet Union and all the rest of the world when you cross the border, as I did in 1932, just struck you in the face. There was no way to hide the fact that millions of people were being arrested for nothing. But you always were taught that it was to break an uh, underground movement that was anti-Soviet, you see. And so the more they caught, the better, he felt. But then it grew to such proportions. And then people who you knew were innocent were taken. Unlike Hitler, who struck in a night or two, the Night of the Long Knives, against his opponents in the Nazi party in 1934, Stalin struck leisurely over a period of two, three, four, five years. It was impossible, I think, for people to convince themselves eventually that they wouldn't be next. Your neighbor was arrested, upstairs, downstairs, in one apartment house. Uh, if there were 20 apartments, there were 10 apartments where people had been arrested. The mother, the father, the son, somebody had been arrested. The extent of the arrests could not possibly be hidden. It was Stalin who invented the category, this unthinkable category of relatives of the enemies of the people. So that when a person was convicted for being an enemy of the people on spurious trumped up charges, his wife, his children, his parents, his brothers and sisters were guilty under the law for being relatives of the enemies of the people and would also be sent off to concentration camps. Can you imagine 12 and 13 and 14 year old kids? No one was too young to be a victim of Joseph Stalin. By the mid 1930s, 15 of every 100 Russian males had disappeared into graves or slave labor camps. Within the borders of Soviet Russia, Stalin controlled everything and everyone. Germany, beaten and forlorn a few years before, now strutted and boasted before the world. Adolf Hitler was building the all-powerful Nazi state. When I arrived in Berlin, it had been completely transformed by Hitler and by Goebbels. Goebbels didn't believe in one flag at a time. It was a hundred flags or a thousand flags. Everything was moving, everybody was working. Every communications device was being used to promote national socialist aims and you felt just encompassed in this uh, rhetoric all the time in fact it would get so bad that you begin to think to yourself well i'm beginning to believe that stuff but many people believed hitler won't be chancellor very long after two weeks after two months people will find out that he has a great big mouth but can do nothing at all everybody underestimated him that was one of his great strengths in retrospect, that he was able to do all these things very quietly and get them done, build the army, build the air force, build the navy, do all of these things with people sitting around saying that silly fellow can't do anything. The question's always asked, how can an army of professional officers follow a fruitcake like Hitler? The answer's very simple, You've gotta remember, the army was the recipient of, of the largesse from Hitler from the minute Hitler started into his political career on. And, you know, let's face it, the rearmament of Germany was something that was totally illegal. But when it happened, the United States, Britain, and France kind of turned our back on that as it was going on and allowed it to continue without making it an issue. We knew the guy was, was pretty much uh, clubbing people down in Germany and beginning to do so elsewhere. But 
there was a strong feeling among powerful people of our country that Hitler wasn't that bad. He made the trains run on time, but also beautiful autobahns. Look at what that guy did. Not all of Hitler's admirers of the 1930s lived in Germany. 22,000 American Nazis held a rally in New York's Madison Square Garden. A few opponents who showed up were beaten for their trouble. But most Americans hardly noticed. There was no mood in the nation to stop him. I was simply looked on as a zealot talking about anti-Nazis. My God, the man's done nothing but end unemployment and make the people happy. So we were partly the secret of Hitler's success. The average American wasn't thinking of Hitler, wasn't thinking of Stalin. Was thinking one thing only, putting some food on the table. But communism was the great bugaboo, the great bogey, the great fear. Anything to stop them. Go, well, this guy Hitler, at least he's putting down the Bolshevs. He's putting down the unions, too, as well. And so the big boys didn't mind that. In fact, many of the top industrialists spoke of Hitler and fascism as the 20th century miracle. That was the phrase they used, the 20th century miracle. During the year of the Olympics in 1936, I was only 14 years old, and somebody managed to get me there to watch. It was the emotional high point of the Nazi movement. Everything was ahead of me. Ich verkünde die Spiele von Berlin zur Feier der ersten Olympiade neuer Zeitrechnung als eröffnet. I grew up in the Bronx, going to Germany, and being part of that team was a great adventure for me. I look back upon it with a different perspective now. How could I have not known then what was going to take place five and six years later? I didn't get past the sports page in those days. We didn't have any idea about World War II or anything. All we see these guys really getting ready for it. Everybody had uniforms over there. They were marching along. And, and we saw this plane flying, these planes flying by. And I never saw a plane that fast. Whew. And the guy said, what kind of plane is that? He said, is that the mail plane? <laughs> Boy, they, really, they got mail, great mail over here. The Germans looked at Adolf Hitler as though he were God. And you could see that adoration in their eyes. As we marched into the stadium of 120,000 people, and this was our first sight of Hitler, and you could hear the comment through, the, through the, the ranks of the American athletes, and I said it as well. He looks just like Charlie Chaplin. He looked paunchy, pasty-faced, almost a comic figure. And he'd come into the box with an entourage of individuals, uh, Hermann Goering in his resplendent uniforms. And he was uh, one man I've described uh, every time I think of him as poor scene. He was truly pig-like with those big red cheeks and Joseph Goebbels, who looked like a rat. Hitler and, and all of his guys were standing over there in the corner matching shoe shines and talking, you know. And he said, I said, that's Hitler. Said, oh, yeah, well, my big deal. You know, we didn't, uh, we didn't, no, I didn't give a damn. He'd sit in his chair slightly ahead of the rest of the individuals in his box, and he'd rock back and forth in the competition, and he'd stare out there, and he'd stare out there, and he'd rub his palms on the tops of his thighs, rocking back and forth while Germans competed. Hitler's bombast about German racial superiority was punctured before his eyes in those 1936 Olympics. The athletes who did it were black Americans, led by the great sprinter Jesse Owens. We were different, you know. In fact, we were real different. We were dark horses. They regarded us as something like, like Martians or something from other world. And they, 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 they couldn't figure us out, you know. They want to know, they want to know uh, how come you guys can run so fast and let me look at your foot and legs and all. In fact, they had some anthropologists make a study of Jesse Owens to figure out exactly what his physique was. And it turns out that they decided he was a Norwegian. <laughs> and Hitler, well, he's up in the box, you know, and these guys are getting their ass kicked. 10.2, world's record. Jesse upstaged everybody, 
especially him. Everybody there, Jesse Owens, 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 you know, and, and then everybody said, who, who the hell is Hitler? The story of Hitler now shaking hands, Jesse Owens, later on the daughter of the American ambassador at dinner given by the Ribbentrops that a young SS man explained it to her because he'd heard the Fuhrer say, it isn't fair. Blacks are not human beings, they're swift animals. And to put a leopard, a cheetah, or a black up against our athletes is not fair. Why should I shake hands with him? This was a totally unfair thing to do to us. You see, that was his view. He didn't hate Jesse Owens, just wasn't sure how human he was. Hitler was being enormously embarrassed by blacks, non-Aryans, standing on the winning podium. American blacks were doing magnificently in the Olympic Games. And this was smashing to smithereens this myth of Nazi Aryan supremacy. If Aryan supremacy was in question, German military supremacy was not. Five months before the Olympics, Adolf Hitler had sent his troops marching into the Rhineland, a territory Germany lost in World War I. No one tried to stop him. Not a drop of blood was shed. He was so successful doing impossible things that you began to think he could do anything. He went into the Rhineland, no one reacted. You would have thought the French worried about their country would react, they didn't. He went into Austria and he took it. I think the legend was well based. You began to think that man can't be defeated. In September 1938, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain succumbed to Hitler's armed blackmail. Yes, Chamberlain told Hitler and his foreign minister von Ribbentrop, you may invade one more country, Czechoslovakia. Fine, said Hitler, and after that, there will be peace. You have my solemn promise. We came down the steps, and I was following Ribbentrop and Hitler. And of course, I was listening with a long ear what they were talking. And Ribbentrop was furious about this German-English agreement Hitler had signed and signed. And then Hitler said, don't bother, don't worry. This piece of paper has nothing to say at all. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. Believing Adolf Hitler was the biggest and last mistake of Chamberlain's career. Within months, Hitler's armies were on the move again, and the Fuhrer of Germany made another solemn promise, this time to Joseph Stalin, a man he never met and cordially despised. Nevertheless, on August 24, 1939, the world awoke to the news that Germany and Russia had signed a non-aggression pact. Stalin watched it all very quietly. There were many eyewitnesses. Hitler sent his own photographer to attend to surreptitiously photograph Stalin's ears because Hitler had some idea that if you have an attached earlobe, you have Jewish blood. He wanted to really find out. That was a sneaky little thing he did. The pact simply took Poland, split it in half. Germany said, here, take half of Poland, take Romania, Estonia, Latvia. We won't interfere with Finland. How's that? Great. The pact was concluded on August 20. Third, Hitler invaded Poland on September 1st. The world went to war the next day. The Polish army, unprepared and outnumbered, collapsed under a furious blitzkrieg. Hitler's army took part of the country, and by arrangement, two weeks later, Stalin's army took the rest. People were aghast because they had been fed for so long on the, the sort of the diabolical of danger coming from, from the Soviet Union and communism and the rest, that suddenly to find Adolf in bed with Joseph Stalin was beyond belief. When World War I broke out, I've seen many accounts of it, people went in the streets, cheered, paraded, and danced. When World War II broke out, the, the streets were empty. They went inside and worried. Friend, I have lots of German friends. They worried. They didn't want to get into war. After that, they got so deep into conquest, they couldn't get out. They were on a tiger and didn't know how to get off. Hitler's armies quickly subdued Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg. 
In June of 1940, German troops marched in triumph down the Champs-Élysées in Paris. Adolf Hitler had reversed the outcome of World War I. He had turned history on its head. He was hailed in Berlin as a conqu... Hermann Göring. I saw him many times when he was driving in an open Mercedes in the streets. And I also was at the parade when the German troops returned from France. And I saw this hysterics of the people, you know, the crowds that were standing around, women especially, you know, women were trying to reach him, to touch him, to bring the infants, you know, that they could touch him. They were all you know, like crazy. He took the Germans from a period of terrible inferiority to a height of euphoria. If Hitler had died in June of we come to Hitler's murder of 11 million civilians at least, half of them Russians, Ukrainians, Poles, gypsies, homosexuals of every nationality. And then to the most chilling phrase to come out of World War II, the final solution, the attempted annihilation of all the Jews of Europe. Yeah, when, when Hitler came to power, the Jews in Germany knew they were in for a rough time. But nobody in the world imagined such a thing as mass murder. Nobody, that is, except Hitler and his inner circle. It began with the boycott of Jewish businesses, and then the exclusion of Jews from German citizenship and, and uh, public office. First business life, then public and social life, and finally, life itself. It all started in 1933. The first open anti-Jewish signs were in Berlin when swastikas were smeared onto store windows and when men stood there saying, do not buy from Jews, boycott them. I suppose people like my father at that time said, well, that can't mean me. He was a natural optimist and he said, no. People are too good for that. This can't go on for very long. This is the thing that'll go away. It'll all collapse and crumble. And it didn't. I believe it was March 15 when there was a knock on our door that invited me and all the other Jewish population from my city to go to a brick factory where uh, we were gathered and Magda and I, my older sister and I, were put on a cattle car. I remember I had a boyfriend those days, my first boyfriend, and he and I would date one another and talk about our future and how it's going to be after all this is going to be over. And when I got into the transport, somehow he found me in that cattle car and somehow he was able to look at me and he said, whatever happens, I will never forget your eyes and your hands. And in Auschwitz, that kept me busy. I kept looking at my hands and I kept asking people, what, what about my eyes? What about my eyes? And, and that reminds me when we were shaven completely and Magda, who had beautiful, long, blonde locks, looked at me and asked me, how do I look? So you see, instead of pointing out to her what she lost, I was able to somehow concentrate on something that she had still left in her. And instead of telling her that she looked like a naked dog, I said to her, Magda, you have beautiful eyes. In 
the cattle car. I was together with my father, my mother, and my little brother, and 39 other members of my family, aunts, uncles, and cousins. But finally, we all came up from the train, and I tried to be together with my father, with my mother, and with my little brother. And then the loudspeaker came on, and they told us to separate the men in one group and the women and children in another group. And unfortunately, my little brother turned to me and asked me, where do I belong, to the men or to the women? And because he was very, very ill during the four and a half days, I told him to go with my mother. Because mothers are the people who take care of sick children. And I never could forgive myself. My mother and brother were nowhere. They disappeared. So that was my arriving to Auschwitz. Friday, the 30th of October, 1942. I have lost a good sister, whom I loved dearly. I have lost so many who were close to me. But their absence does not hurt me as much as that of my life's companion, whom I used to call child. And what makes the pain more intense until I almost go insane, is the way in which she left this veil of tears, while animals have appeared and murdered her. Where are you, child of mine? Abraham Levin. When it came to the terrible extinction of Jewish people, intelligent people say, how is it possible? It's not true. Then everybody knew. No, lots of people did not know and did not try to find out. And very often people don't believe what they see, but what they like to believe. And if they have some help by a good propaganda, they are too uh, prepared to accept the illusion. We, we did, just didn't really react to it. And before long, well, there weren't any Jews in our daily lives anymore. And so the problem didn't exist anymore. It was as easy as that. It was back in the days when Adolf Hitler was just another out-of-work politician that he first discovered the small mountain town of Berchtesgaden. He found inspiration among the soaring alpine peaks. When he came to power, he built a grand retreat up here. My mother and I spent long weekends in his famous place in Berchtesgaden. I used to call him Uncle Dolph and was told by my parents when I was 11 to stop that and start calling him Herr Hitler. He had a way with children and he would come down to your level and he would be there entirely for you. And this is something irresistibly fascinating for a child or indeed anyone. You see, Hitler was not an ogre, a monster from the beginning. At that time, the time of his glory or so, for us young people, he was like a nice uncle. The first time when I came to the mountain place of Hitler, I pinched myself. I thought, it's not possible. Now I'm here, and the place where German justice will be restored. My career was incredible because I was 25 years old and I looked at Hitler like at an, an half-god, you know? And 
Then came Eva Braun in, and I didn't know about her existence. Nobody knew, no. Eva Braun, a former shopkeeper, 33 years younger than Hitler, provided him pleasant diversion. She entertained his guests and made him laugh. She gave him a feeling of a bourgeois life with cakes, with tea. He liked her. I don't think he was very much, but she was in love. She was in love, certainly. Women adored him. They adored him. There are so many who say they have suffered in the Third Reich and so on. I have seen them, how they greeted him, how they came to invitations and so on. And so many people, higher class people, say they suffered. They all came to all invitations. They all shouted high. They should shut up now and should admit it. I interviewed many people that adored him and to this day they like him because he was so kind to them and he was very thoughtful to them. He loved animals, he loved to have dogs around him. This is all part of the same man. He never ate meat, he didn't drink. In the chancellery, smoking was absolutely forbidden. So that I found myself very often with ministers and important generals in the loo where we smoked secretly. Then we opened the window and with a towel, we moved the smoke out by the window, no? And he was very clean. He bathed twice in the day. But I think these clean people are always dangerous. Hitler's inner circle was comprised of the most powerful collection of misfits the world has ever known. Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, Heinrich Himmler, head of the secret police, Rudolf Hess, second in command of the Nazi party, and commander of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Goering. Goering was a favorite of mine because he bribed me. Every time he came to our house, he gave me five marks, and this was immense. He was fat, he was vigorous, he was amusing, he was likable, very likable. This is the man who started the secret police in the Hitler regime. But a gregarious fellow and, and colorful. I remember once at the Russian embassy, some people who knew him got around and said, well, you know, Hermann, how are you? And he sort of made a gesture, like an injection into his arm and said, and said none of that, none of that. Of course, he was addicted to, uh, to pills of various sorts. Hess struck me as a weirdo. I remember he would spend times when they were not talking by trying to balance a straight back chair so that it would stand on its hind legs. And he would glare at this chair, trying by willpower to make that chair stay on its two hind legs in balance. And I decided that the guy was nuts, which he was. Himmler was pale, his chin receded. He looked like a, a hard-working bookkeeper who was glad to be out for lunch in the sunlight. And he would crack jokes and everyone laughed. You always laughed at Himmler's jokes. Goebbels, he was a small man. He used to be a playwright and didn't succeed. Partly crippled and a crippled mind, but brilliant. He was a, a sardonic, bright, uh, but unpleasant man. Totally fixed on his function. He let nothing, he let no scruple, he let no compunction stand in the way. My father was soon ousted from the inner circle. And I remember my last meeting with Hitler, which caused a kind of personal break between him and me. There was this receiving line, and Hitler was shaking hands. I had made the mistake of thinking that I could stop the receiving line to have a real talk with him, which was absurd, but I had made that mistake. He, however, withdrew his hand from mine and suddenly didn't see me anymore and barked orders to some adjutants over my head and then my mother gently 
pushed me along and I was completely taken aback and somehow felt that there had been a, a, a break, that this, that this was not the man I had known and liked and in a way even loved. No personal friendship, no past loyalty, no record of service mattered to Adolf Hitler now. A voice had spoken to him, the same voice that spoke to Caesar and Charlemagne. It said, this is your moment. You can rule the world. June of 1941, Adolf Hitler's flagrant ambition directed itself toward the greatest prize of all, Stalin's Russia. The world saw the attack coming. Joseph Stalin was the last to know. The Germans massed 3,200,000 people on the border of Russia before they attacked. You don't, you don't move 3,200,000 people to anybody's border without it being detected. And worse yet, two Germans defected. Two Germans defected and actually came across the lines to report to the Russians on the other side of the line that they were going to attack. And the second one swam across the river to report to the Russians that the Germans were going to attack. And you know what Stalin did? He said, execute that man. He's, he's trying to foment an incident between the Germans and the Russians, and we just don't want any incidents. He refused to take a step that he thought might provoke Hitler. That was the whole thing. Don't provoke Hitler. He's suspicious. Let's show him we're good people. We're partners. We're reliable. Let's honor, let's go beyond honoring the letter of the agreement. Let's go that extra step. On the 22nd of June, three million German soldiers crossed the border into Russia. Stalin was dumbfounded. Stalin appeased Hitler in a way that no one else had, and then he paid the price. Solzhenitsyn said Stalin only trusted one person in his entire life, Hitler, and he betrayed him too. Stalin sank into a deep depression and disappeared from public view. He left his people at the mercy of waves of advancing German troops. For Stalin, above all people, it was almost impossible to admit he'd been wrong. Not wrong on some small personal level, but wrong in the sense that everything built in Russia since the revolution, everything Stalin had killed and struggled for, was now on the edge of the abyss. Stalin refused to believe it so that when Hitler invaded, he went through the Russian army like a hot knife through butter. The Germans came, and the Germans tried to impress us with their seriousness about it all. So what they did was send an armed patrol to every corner house and every street, and out of every house they took out two men at random, shot them, and just let them lie there. They came and they took one of my uncles and my grandfather, and we heard the shots, and we came out, and we just saw the bodies lying there. The Germans had taken over five million Russian prisoners of war. Five million, because they were surrendering in droves. They starved them, they executed them, there were mass executions. In some POW camps there was cannibalism because they were not fed at all. Out of the five million prisoners, three and a half million died in captivity. All the Germans were pleased because they saw a colony coming to them, a giant rich colony. And Germans were buying Russian dictionaries. There was a bookshop near me and I checked on that. They were buying Russian dictionaries to learn the language in time to go out there. And it was going to be their India, and uh, the Black Sea was going to be their Riviera. They were laying these wonderful plans, which died very soon. After seven days of total silence, Joseph Stalin reappeared. Then he got very angry. 
with the German advance, his first reaction was to shoot the army commanders at the front. First of all, we, we should never forget that he annihilated over 50% of his officer corps in the purges of 1938. I mean, one half of the entire officer corps was executed. That does not establish a very good relationship with, with the remainder of your officer corps, you know. And so they were, they were terrorized, I mean, they were absolutely terrified. With each army ruled by an erratic dictator who thought himself a military genius, the German-Russian war became a mutual slaughter. Hitler followed his army east. He moved his headquarters to a mosquito-infested swamp on the Russian border, where he had enormous concrete bunkers erected, reinforced, and camouflaged. He named it the Wolf's Lair. Here he settled down to command his war. His whole staff came out here. Yodel said, the wolf's lair is something between a cloister and a concentration camp. You read the attitude of people who came here and stayed here for very long, and they were going crazy out of the boredom of the place. Hitler would come into the dining hall at night, traditionally started his dinner late, and eat and start these harangues, monologues, that would go on until dawn. He had no sense of humor at all he quite often attacked the army and the generals and even he told them that they had not um, the necessary courage. And he interfered in small details, much to the horror of the military leaders. He was convinced that he was an infallible strategist and all he had to do was to order it to happen and the will of the German soldier would make it happen. The word will appears in Hitler's speeches and writings constantly. This was a fixation of his, and he had this extraordinary will, which sometimes took the form of tantrums, and he would tongue-lash people who tried to oppose him and just cut them down. Don't ever tell the Fuhrer he's wrong. Don't ever tell the Fuhrer about casualties. Don't ever tell the Fuhrer anything that's going to upset him. Now. That's the story of Hitler right there. He was a man who believed very much in his intuition. And he was a gambler. He gambled all or nothing. And he put always all again in the pot. Hitler the gambler staked everything on a drive toward the distant Russian oil fields. But directly in his path, lay a city Stalin had named for himself, Stalingrad. Stalingrad became an obsession with Hitler because it was the first time where his Blitzkrieg army was stopped cold and he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe that his great German army, the will of the German soldier, could not overcome the will of the Russian peasant. Stalin matched Hitler's bet and raised him. He sent every soldier he had to Stalingrad with orders to take not one step back under penalty of death. The 23rd of August, 1942, the Luftwaffe went in and leveled Stalingrad, leveled, turned it into rubble. 40,000 civilians were killed in those first two days. And without knowing it, what they were doing was creating the absolutely perfect defensive situation for the Soviets. And something magical happened to the Soviet soldiers. They were able to go into these rubble buildings and hold off German tanks. For seven months it went on, the most brutal battle in all the history of warfare. Through the summer, the armies fought, and through the fall, and into the Russian winter. This is one of the last buildings that was held by the Russians. They never lost it. It's right down next to the Volga River. Just incredible to think of the suffering that went on here. You sat here and you saw your comrades wounded, terribly wounded, dragged back out of the back of the building across the Volga River, back in, come the replacements. Sometimes you got supplies at night, sometimes you didn't get supplies at night, but no matter what, your orders from Stalin were not one step backwards. So you 
you stayed here and you held this building. If you were lying here wounded, you didn't have medical supplies. The best you could hope for that somebody would stop the bleeding long enough or your leg would freeze or your arm would freeze or your wound would freeze and the blood would stop flowing and they'd get you back across the Volga in time to save your life. Didn't happen very often. I didn't fight for Stalin. I fight for myself, for my family, for my people. Every step is with blood and with soldiers' lives. Every step. We lost many, many, many people. What we have to this is, this is the important thing in this time in Stalingrad. It was a horrible time. There was scarcely any possibility to help the wounded and the hospitals were in a terrible state. And there were heaps of dead outside of these hospitals because there, was, there were no people anymore to, to dig into this ice and snow to, to, to bury the dead. Yeah, they freeze very quickly. There'll still be a hand up in the air, or a leg partly raised off the ground. After a while, you, do, you don't think of it as a human being, as a, having been a human being, because you've seen so many. Of course, this is a very bad situation, but we can stay and we can fight with this but not the German troops. For Russians, it's okay. They never have enough food. We have enough snow. Snow with vodka, that's good. Despite all of what was going on over there, the Russian soldiers were still getting their daily ration of vodka. And, and there's this wonderful story about, about this one commander, battalion commander or regimental commander, he was a colonel, who, um, came to recognize that when he reported his casualties back, they would cut back his rations accordingly. So what he was doing is he wouldn't report any casualties. And even though his unit was getting smaller and smaller and smaller, the daily vodka ration was continuing to come in for the entire unit. And of course, he was consuming most of it himself. Uh, they, they finally, uh, the, finally, the Russian high command looked at this one unit and said, gee, why is it that everybody else is taking such terrible casualties and this one isn't? They went down to investigate and found out that this guy was down to about 20% of his unit, but was continuing to pad the figures to get his vodka ration. So they were gonna take him out and shoot him. On the same day, they decided to drop all charges because Stalin had made him a hero of the Soviet Union based upon his defense of Stalingrad, and this guy survives. The Russians had enormous reserves which were hidden back in the Russian countries, and the Germans didn't know it. Germans were arrogant. They were so arrogant, their entire intelligence apparatus broke down, and the reason it broke down was that they didn't pay any attention to it. They didn't think it was worth anything. No use but trying to find out what the Russians are capable of or what their intentions are, because they're not capable of anything. They have no intentions. They can't, all they can do is react to us. On November 18th, 1942, the Russians stopped reacting. They launched a well-planned, massive, and unexpected counterattack. Within a matter of days, 22 German divisions found themselves surrounded. After two months, starving, freezing, and without supplies, against Adolf Hitler's orders, the Germans surrendered. They were all frightened, expecting to be shot. There's no doubt some of them were. They didn't look like members of the master race. They just looked like they wished they were home. They were all marched across the Volga, ultimately to Siberia. Of the 120,000 that were prisoners, very few ever got out alive. Of every 1,000 people on both sides that went into the Battle of Stalingrad, only three came out. It forever stopped the advance of Hitler's Germany into Russia. From that day forward, every step the Germans took was backwards. Literally, that was the day Germany lost the war.
by the fall of 1943, General, say 50 years ago, it must have been apparent to the German army, wasn't it, that the end of the Third Reich was nearing, uh, even if Hitler wouldn't admit it. Well, you can just imagine what the German army was thinking. I mean, 1942 was supposed to be the year that they brought Russia to its knees. Hitler's strategy called for a thrust up into Leningrad to take Leningrad, another thrust into Moscow to finally capture Moscow, and most importantly to him, a thrust down south into the Caucasus to capture the vital oil fields that the Kaiser had never been able to capture in 1918. At that point, Rommel comes sweeping up out of North Africa, links up, the war with Russia is over, England is forced to come to terms, and it's the end of the war. That was the plan. That was the plan. But what happened? Late 1942, Rommel's defeated at El Alamein. Early 1943, the Soviets surround the German army in Stalingrad with a loss of hundreds of thousands killed and more hundreds of thousands captured. By the middle of the summer in 1943, all across the entire Eastern Front, the German army is retreating and something else is happening. A new front has opened. The British and the Americans have invaded Sicily and Italy and are moving north and they're preparing to invade France. I mean, given the information that his generals are telling him in 1943, it must have been very difficult even for Hitler to maintain appearances. Joseph Goebbels. The birthday of the Führer was celebrated in the late afternoon in Berlin Philharmonic Hall. It was a very dignified and solemn occasion. As always, the Führer is at his post. As long as he is there, one need not worry about the future. As long as he lives in our midst in good health, as long as he can give us the strength of his spirit and the power of his manliness, no evil can touch us. Frederick the Great said, what kind of generals do you hunt for? He said, lucky ones. Well, Hitler was a lucky one for a long time, but his luck ran out. The last time I saw him speak was when he came back from the front. I don't know why he came to Berlin to make a speech, and he looked bad. Everything about him deteriorated. Physically, he deteriorated. He was on the downgrade. He had a terribly trembling left arm and hand, and when he walked, he dragged one feet behind him, and that was not at all the glorious Führer people adored. And so I was really shocked when I saw him in this state of health, and he was a physical wreck. And he ate so many pills, and he had, uh, his doctor gave him injections. And I think that he wasn't normal after 42 he was no more normal. The German public remained overwhelmingly loyal to the Führer, but a handful of army officers feared that he was dragging the nation to its ruin. Quietly, they plotted to murder Adolf Hitler. The plan was that Hitler should look at some new kind of uniforms. And I should be the um, officer who had, had experience with these uniforms on the front and I should have explained it to him. And in that briefcase, which was necessary to have all the papers, there should be the bomb. Von Kleist was sent back to the front early. His attempt to kill Hitler failed, as did at least 14 others. One came close to succeeding. During a meeting in Hitler's heavily guarded Wolf's Lair, an officer placed a bomb under a table. It killed several people, but Hitler survived. Hitler is just badly shaken up. Uh, he comes out, he's got uh, the dust of the fallen building all in his head. Mussolini has come up that day to see him. He's absolutely stunned that Hitler was almost killed. Hitler now thinks that divine providence has saved him. If he was terrible before, he is even worse after this. First of all, they go on a bloodbath. He tells Himmler, you find everybody associated with this. Plus, they threw in a few people who weren't even associated with the plot because they wanted to rid themselves of anybody they thought was weak or their enemy. 5,000 killed, 7,000 arrested, some of them put on meat hooks. I remember still this scene 50 years ago when he threw on the, on the, on the table 
a lot of big photographs of these poor hanged people. And that Hitler was a, was a smile and full of hatred against these people, took these um, photos and looked um, at these, how these people suffered in their end. By late 1944, the Third Reich lay helpless under the day and night assault of Allied warplanes. The Nazi response was to stage parades amid the rubble. Germany is not being defeated. She is merely defending her victories. Joseph Goebbels. And Adolf Hitler, facing the loss of the war, did the one thing he still had power to do. He ordered the Holocaust hastened. Toward the end of the war, when his generals came to him and say, we need trains to carry the troops to the Western Front to stop the Americans who were marching toward Germany, he said, no, I need the trains to kill the Jews. When we finally came to the barracks where the German SS told us that we will be together with our parents and sisters and brothers, they were no one naturally. The girls started to scream and cry. Where are our parents? And then an SS man came forward with the rubber stick pointing to the sky, laughing, and told us, look up, what do you see? And as we did, that was very heavy black smoke covering the, the sky. And he was laughing and told us, there are your parents and there where you are going. And on the way to the gas chamber, I saw that my sister Magda was in one pile and I was in the other. And we had to be very quick decision makers. You know, we didn't have time to contemplate on our navel. And I remember I became a very strong uh, help to my sister. So I knew I had to get to her somewhere, some way, somehow. So I looked at the guard and I began to do my cartwheels and the splits, and I ended up next to my sister. And I bet that guard knew and kind of winked a little bit, okay, go ahead, if you're that courageous. We had to risk. We had to risk. It was just us clinging together, never knowing what's going to happen next. Then my parents, grandparents, everyone died except my dad and I. Yom Kippur, 21st of September, 1942. Those who are far away cannot imagine. They will not understand and will not believe that day after day, thousands of men, women, and children, innocent of any crime, were taken to their death. Almighty God, why did this happen? And why is the whole world deaf to our screams? Abraham Levin. The Russians were advancing on Berlin. The almighty Fuhrer, who had imprisoned so many, found himself a prisoner in a bunker under the city. I had to stay with my boss, and I regarded this as a sentence to death because I knew the um, uh, military situation too well around Berlin. Every day, some parts of the town were conquered by the Soviet troops. And as the hope for an escape out of the bunker became uh, less and less possible, then the discussion of the people centered about the question how to commit suicide. Hitler continued, he continued, he gambled, gambled, and thought he can do something and a miracle would come and the Allies would get in bed in, in, in friction with Russia and so on. And of course he became a perfect, brutal scoundrel and monster. I saw Eva Braun there too. And Eva Braun, um, I, I must say, I, I, th I think it was um, very courageous of her. Hitler didn't want to, to, that she came to Berlin, but she on her own decided, uh, b when the 
uh, situation became worse and worse, she decided, I think, on the 15th of April, on her own to come to Berlin and not to leave Hitler anymore. Just before midnight on April 28th, with eight guests assembled and the song Red Roses playing on the phonograph, Adolf Hitler made Eva Braun his wife. I must say I respect her, and she behaved well, and she died with him, what was fantastic. She behaved much better than all the other friends of Hitler. No? Hitler was asked whether he would allow that we would leave the bunker, and then we finally reported to him, and we talked a half an hour with Hitler, and he had absolutely finished. He had made his will, he had married Eva Braun, it was clear to him that he must die, and the fate of the other people didn't uh, interest him. The Red Army of the Soviet Union overran Berlin on April 30th, 1945. That was the end of Hitler's thousand-year Reich. All the Russian soldiers found of Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun were charred remains. I respected him in a certain way. As such a man like he was, he has a right to a, a romantic death. No? You can't put him in jail. Would you put him in a, in a cage like Stalin wanted? No? And show to all the people, no, die. He asked people to die at least 10 millions, no? So he must die too. In a war, you see death. I mean, death is all around. That's what war is all about. One army trying to kill the other one. When I walked into Buchenwald, I saw another kind of death that I never knew could exist. These people must have suffered like God knows how much suffering they did before they finally died. Bodies are piled one on top of the other, some alive, barely, others dead. It was just horror, disgust, and unbelievably sad that human beings could be treated like that by other human beings. So you said, what the hell kind of people are you dealing with here? And all the Germans standing around crying, we didn't know, we didn't know, we didn't know. After the war, people had hope. The nation had proved itself. 20 million had laid down their lives. So we were sure everything would be different now. And nothing was different. Hundreds of thousands of Russians in Germany who did not want to go back were forced by our soldiers with fixed bayonets onto trains and taken back to the Soviet Union. It's a shameful, shameful chapter. People were committing suicides. Where I was in Germany after liberation in southern Germany, there was a bunch of people locked themselves in the church and set themselves on fire rather than go back to the Soviet Union because they knew darn well what was going to happen. He arrested people just as he'd been arresting them before the war. So everything was back exactly where it had begun. At the very end of his life, he was planning another great terror. Why didn't they kill him? Why didn't they arrest him? Why didn't they mobilize to stop it? Well, he was well guarded and it was difficult, but it wasn't impossible. And I think the answer is they had no self-confidence. They too had bought into the cult of the indispensability of Stalin. These people lacked the self-confidence that they themselves could replace Stalin. 
It was a grievous mistake. The point had come where anyone would have been better, and they were convinced no one else was possible. Stalin never trusted anyone, and toward the end of his life, he was so afraid of assassination that he refused to sleep in the same spot twice. He'd wander the halls of this house of his before finally settling on an empty sofa or a bed in some room where nobody expected to find him. He was so paranoid that he would not accept any medical suggestions. He even was very, very careful about brushing his teeth because there might be poison on that tooth powder. Stalin ordered, arrested all the doctors that were around him, all the doctors that treated him. He suspected that they wanted to poison him and to kill him. So all of them were in jail. When he had this stroke, there were new doctors that never treated him, that were afraid even to approach him, and actually he died. When he died, you think people rejoiced? They were devastated. Lots of people wept, lots of people. You don't imagine how many people came to his burial. Oh, and huge amount of people were killed because the mob was so, so large that people were tramped over, lots of people. Even in death, Stalin was a killer. Hitler and Stalin inflicted on the world is part of my own memory, yours too. This is not exactly ancient history here. I think we are bound to ask the question, could it happen again? Of course it could. All that's necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. And that's what happened in the 1930s. The world ignored Hitler and Stalin until it looked up and found all of Europe in flames. Of course, there are differences today. Uh, this time when neo-Nazis showed up in Germany, two million Germans turned out to demonstrate against them. Looks like the dangerous right-wingers of Germany are a distinct minority. Yeah, but I think we should remember that Hitler's National Socialist Party at one time was a tiny minority. And when ideas like Hitler's come up in the world again, as they are, the world would be well advised to take notice. National Socialism is based on blood. We want to keep our blood clean. And the people are searching for alternatives. And we are the only alternative. Communism, we had it. Western demography, we have it. Uh, National Socialism, maybe we will have. I hope so. It's a very sad phenomenon because these young uh, rioters haven't the faintest idea of what the Third Reich was and what Nazism was or could be and so forth. Uh, this is chiefly a form of rebellion. Every German youth knows that the quickest way he can get the establishment in a dither is to paint swastikas on Jewish tombstones. I believe that our biggest enemy is ignorance. And I think people who are ignorant will always look for a dictator so they wouldn't have to think for themselves. I don't think Hitler could have done it alone. I think it took ages and ages of prejudices. And, and I am talking about what parents do and how they brainwash their children and the messages that we believe, that some people are better than we are or some people are less than we are. I think it begins there. I'm hoping that we have learned from history to prevent that from happening again. 
as we look back and say what was Stalin's legacy and could it happen again today, we make a mistake if we minimize what Stalin was. We're talking literally tens of millions of people killed, imprisoned, tortured, deported. This is not something that happens often in history. So I think Russia is capable of new despotism today, but a new despotism wouldn't be Stalin's. It might be terrible, but not that kind of terrible. Of course it could happen again. To begin with, it is happening now. It is happening. In what was Yugoslavia, you have acts of savagery. This is the greatest evil that could ever come, and it comes from an ideology that denies the sacredness, the holiness of a human being, the right to live of a human being, and the fact that there is an eternal right and wrong. You mentioned the most terrible words of World War II, the words final solution. But there are two other words that came out of the Holocaust. And these are the words that we must all remember never again. Good night, General. And good night to you from CBS Reports.